Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our workshop on uh, high throughput uh, biomark or discovering biomarkers from high throughput drug response screens. Uh, so to begin, I just wanted to point out a few things. First of all, if you uh, we're going to be working off primarily the pre-built package down vignette uh, that's available through the link here. Um, but being an R markdown, as with all the other workshops, if you go to the link at the bottom of the description, you'll be taken to an R Studio uh, session where you can follow along as well and run the code uh, as we're going through it. Um, yeah, and just to find the vignette, you can, it's in the vignettes folder under GX Workshop. Um, yeah, the primary reason why we're not working through the R Studio is because the figures end up quite small and hard to see. Uh, and then, as Levi mentioned, uh, there is during the workshop right now a live help desk if you have any issues, uh, any R bioconductor issues, or you want help running some things. And the link is also in the chat box on the Pathable website. Uh, so then, I guess we should get started. Uh, so I'm going to introduce myself. My name is Peter Smirnoff. Um, one of the I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Toronto and also at the Prince Margaret Cancer Center uh, in Toronto. And one of the developers of the package that we're going to be discussing today. Uh, and then I'll let Arvind and Chris uh, introduce themselves. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Arvind and I'm a postdoctoral fellow at Princess Margaret Cancer Research Center. And I'm one of the developer of the package Jiva that we will introduce soon. Hi, I'm Chris. Um, I'm a software developer in the Benjamin Habekane's lab at the Princess Margaret Cancer Research Center in Toronto, Ontario. Um, and I am the primary developer of Radio GX, um, and I also work with Peter on Pharmaco GX and some of the other GX packages. Okay, so Arvind, if you want to get started with the introduction. Yes. Okay, so welcome everyone. As you might know, the uh, title of this workshop is Biomarker Discovery uh, from high throughput screening data set. So uh, I'm, okay, yeah. So Peter, can you go a little down? Yep. Introduction, yeah, great. So uh, this workshop is mostly focused on how do we find, how we, do we try to find biomarker dis, uh, biomarkers uh, for the drug response predicting biomarkers from the high throughput screening data. So as you might all know that in the case of cancer precision medicine, there is a requirement to find the biomarkers. Biomarkers which can predict drug response with high accuracy. And to find these biomarkers, we basically use the genomic data uh, and we try to connect this genomic data with the drug response. Now this drug response can be from the patients, but finding the patient data uh, or the clinical trial data is very expensive and having this clinical trial data is very expensive. So we use different kind of model systems uh, in cancer pharmacogenomics to find these biomarkers. One of such model systems are cell lines. They have been the workhorse of cancer research. So basically uh, to develop a can cancer cell line, we take a patient sample, a tumor sample and uh, try to grow it in a dish. Not every sample goes in the dish, but some of the Sometimes some of the cells have properties that allow them to grow in the dish and then you can passage them. And if it's a cell line is very really stable, you can submit it to ATCC, a web form where you can order these cell lines. And then you can grow and expand these cell lines in your lab. Uh, and to do the pharmacogenomics, you of course can test different drugs on these cell lines. So basically you test different concentration of drug and you see how many cells are surviving after a certain amount of time. So this is a normal drug screening, uh, cell line based drug screening procedure where you have drug concentration on the X axis and on Y axis, you have the viability or how many cells are uh, surviving basically. 
uh, you can measure different properties from this curve such as IC50 or AUC area under the curve or area above the curve and so forth. And also you can do the genomic profiling on these cell lines or these cell line models that can be RNA seq mutation, copy number, etc. And our aim is to connect these two pieces, the, the genomic data along with the drug response data to find the biomarkers which can predict this drug response from the genomic features. So that in future, if you have a patient which have those particular genomic properties, you can recommend a particular drug. At least that's the big hope of the precision medicine in cancer field is. So we apply different kind of statistical methods and uh, tools to do this. Uh, and this kind of procedure to, to, to streamline all these procedure to have the genomic data very well formatted as well as drug response data very well formatted. Uh, we have developed different suite of tools to do this kind of analysis that we are going to talk about. Another aspect or another, uh, um, so, so similar to the drugs, you can use radiation also as a therapy major. So this is called radio genomics. The idea is same here. You have different cell lines. You uh, test, you, you expose them to different amount of radiation here in the x-axis. You have the dose of the radiation and you look at the how many, what percent of cells are surviving after a particular time. And again, the aim here is same to connect this drug, rest, uh, no, sorry, radiation response data with the genomic data from the cell lines and find biomarkers for the radiation. So this was the in vitro pharmacogenomics because we are working with the models that are grown in a, in a dish or a, so it's basically in vitro. There are other kind of model systems that the people are trying to more and more use that are in vivo uh, kind of model. So what in, in in vivo model or patient drive xenografts, what we do is that you take a patient sample, tumor sample, and you implant it in an immune deficient mice. As this mice is immune deficient, uh, the tumor grows there. At one point when the tumor is large enough, you remove the tumor, you sacrifice the mice and remove the tumor, and you can implant it into the new mice. So this way you have more and more patient material or tumor material. At one point when you want to test your drug, in an ideal case, let's say you have six PDXs, you declare three as a control, so they do not get any drug and the rest you give your choice of drug. And in best case, and, and we measure the tumor volume uh, across the time or let's say every week. And in best case, we are hoping something like this where you have uh, control and the treatment curve. In the control group, the tumor volume is increasing with time while in your treatment group, the tumor volume is decreasing with time if your drug is effective. And same uh, as previously I mentioned, Again, here, aim is to connect the genomic data from the patient or the PDXs with this drug response data and to find the biomarkers which can predict this drug response. Okay, so up next, I'm going to talk about um, some of the packages we built for handling these different types of experimental data. Um, those packages are PharmacoGX um, for in vivo pharmacogenomics co-genomic data, RadioGX for in vitro um, radiogenomic data, and finally Ziva for in vivo um, pharmacogenomic data. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about the data structures they provide um, and how to access information within them. Um, so we'll start with PharmacoGX. Um, PharmacoGX provides uh, the Pharmacoset class um, which is a standardized container for drug screening and molecular profile, da pro profile data um, in cancer cell line experiments. Um, so if you have a take, if you take a look at the class diagram um, available in the PharmacoGX section, um, you'll see here each box represents um, an object uh, within the PharmacoSet class. Um, so you'll see PharmacoSet in the center um, and Surrounding that are each of the subcomponents um, that make up the pharmacoset. Uh, within each of these boxes, the first cell um, indicates the name and type of the object. 
The second cell indicates the object structure uh, and what is composed of. And the third cell indicates the accessor methods provided by the PharmacoGX package um, for getting data from each of these subcomponents. So as you may have already noticed, um, there are three major categories of data stored within a PharmacoSet object. Um, firstly, we have in green our metadata slash annotations. Um, secondly, in blue, we have our molecular data, um, in this case stored as a list of bioconductor summarized experiment objects. And finally, in red, we have our treatment response data um, from the respective drug screenings. Um, so I encourage everyone to explore this diagram, but in the interest of time, um, I must move on. Um, so pharmacoset objects are in general too large to be included in an R package uh, and as a result we provide a set of standardized functions um, for accessing information and downloading these uh, data sets um, online. Um, so the first of these is the available psets function. Um, and this is called with no arguments. Um, and what you get back is a data frame, um, including the names of all available P sets, um, as well as metadata such as associated publications, um, the type of experiment, um, and the DOI um, of the PharmacoSet object. Um, and this is actually related to both the uh, identity and version um, of that PharmacoSet object. Uh, once you have selected the PharmacoSet that you would like to work with, um, you use the download PSET function. Um, its first argument is the PSET name. Um, and as an optional second argument, you have save directory. Um, and this is just where you want that file to be saved. Um, calling this function returns the object. And you can see here we assign them to variables corresponding to the names of the respective PSETs. Um, Okay, moving on to Radio GX. Um, a radio set is very similar to a pharmaco set. Um, the key difference being that it stores uh, radiation response data instead of um, dose response data um, from small molecules. So examining the class diagram in this section, you'll see that um, it mirrors the same patterns um, as pharmaco GX. Um, and so I'm going to uh, assume that, that um, from our last section, you'll be able to read this diagram as well. Um, moving on to accessing um, our set objects, uh, we provide an analogous set of functions um, in the Radio GX package, namely available R sets, which will get you a list of all available R sets. At this time, there's currently only one implemented um, from the Cleveland Clinic data set, um, but this should expand in the future. Um, in order to download this object, uh, again, you call the download R set function uh, with the name of the R set you wanna download and an optional directory to save that file in. Okay, and moving on to the Ziva package. Um, Ziva uh, exports the Ziva set object um, and this is a standardized container for in vivo treatment response experiments, um, primarily in patient-derived xenograft models, so mouse models of cancer. Um, and as a result of the difference in experimental design um, between in vivo and in vitro experiments, um, the object structure and its accessors um, also tend to differ from PharmacoGX and RadioGX. Um, so having a look um, at the object structure, um, the first uh, key slot to, within the object um, is the experiment slot. Um, this slot stores um, a list of PDX model class objects, um, which store both the treatment response data um, for a given mouse, as well as numerous um, metadata and annotations related to that specific model. Um, the next major concept that's important um, for understanding a Ziva set um, is the idea of a batch. Now, um, if you look at uh, 
the figure available in the Zeta Set section. Um, you'll see a diagram outlining that. Um, and a batch is essentially a collection of PDX models um, from a single patient uh, with a single treatment. And within each of these batches, you have two branches, uh, your control branch, uh, which receives no treatment, and your treatment branch, uh, which receives um, some drug or combination of drugs. Um, metadata associated with um, the different models can be accessed in the model slot, um, and we'll talk about some of the, the methods we provide for accessing this data a little bit later on. Um, finally, uh, analogous to PharmacoGX and RadioGX, um, you can access molecular data associated with a, a ZivaSet um, in the molecular profile slot. Um, and this uh, is also named by molecular data type, um, but uses an expression set instead of a summarized experiment. Um, so downloading um, a Ziva set is a uh, little bit different from the other um, two packages as well, um, as the, we have integrated um, the available and download functions into a single download Ziva set function. Um, so when you call this function with no arguments, um, just like available P set or R set, um, it returns uh, a data frame uh, with the names of the available sets uh, as well as metadata about those. Um, and when you're ready to download one, um, you will just pass in the name of the Ziva set you want to download. Um, so for this workshop, uh, we've actually included all of these data sets. Um, so to load the associated ones for PharmacoGX, you're going to run data GDSC and data CCLE. Um, both of those are all caps. Uh, for the radio set, you're going to run uh, data Cleveland. That's with a capital C, like the city. Um, and finally, to load the data for Ziva, you'll run data BRCA underscore full, um, all lowercase. Um, and for um, the rest of the analysis, we also need to assign that to a variable called BRCA. So moving so, on. Oh, sorry. So, 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 oh. Yep. Yeah. Uh, uh, Chris, uh, I would like to just uh, uh, point out a relevant question about before you go ahead. So as you talked about this available P set and uh, download data from the Jiva, there is a very relevant question that from where to get both kind of drug radiation data and the genomic data for the same cell lines, any recommended data databases. So Peter, could you comment on this, where this data is coming from and? Yes, definitely. So uh, basically what we did was, um, or what we continuously do is we uh, look at the largest pharmacogenomics and radiogenomics studies that do high throughput screening uh, combined with molecular profiling, such as the CCLE, the Cancer Cell Line Encyclopedia, uh, the Sanger Project Genomics of Drug Sensitivity in Cancer. Uh, together now they form the DEFMAP project, uh, but also other studies um, as well. And what we do is we take the data that are released either through their own portals uh, or through uh, associated files with the articles, and we process them into this packaged up data structure uh, built on top of the bioconductor classes uh, and make them available for download. Uh, and we're using, so you can always get uh, I apologize, the, my screen's a bit narrow because I'm quite zoomed in, but you can get the uh, associated publication when you run the available PSET function or RSET. And then um, we're, what we're using right now to get, make sure that each data set and version has a DOI is we're uploading them to a service called Zenodo, which uh, like Figshare or other data repositories, uh, it's meant for ensuring that the object has a DOI that's, and you can always download the exact same version of the data. Um, and if you want to know a bit more about how we're doing the pre-processing of all this data, there's actually a short talk uh, tomorrow in, at the conference by uh, another member of our lab. I'll post the link to that, Anthony. Um, uh, in the chat box once the workshop's over and also on the Slack. I hope that answers the question. 
Okay, if there's no more questions, I will move on to the next section. Um, and this Actually, is a, yeah, sorry, could I just ahead. interject? If you are following along in the R Studio, I want to comment that we provided some data sets for the purpose of illustrating the functions in the, in the vignette package, but uh, they're usually slimmed down versions of the data. Uh, again, just because uh, our package of several gigabytes is not very user friendly. Yep, continue. Okay, um, so next we're gonna talk about examining and extracting data of interest. So we've got an idea about the data structures that are provided by these three packages. Um, now we're gonna look at how do we get to that data um, in a reproducible way. Um, so to start talking about PharmacoGX and RadioGX, um, we really have to mention CoreGX, um, which is a dependency for both of those packages. Um, what this package does is it provides um, shared infrastructure um, and allows abstracting a lot of functionality um, from the individual packages um, into CoreGX. Um, and this includes uh, defining a class, the core set, from which the radio set and uh, Pharmaco set uh, both inherit. Um, so as a result of this, we see very similar accessor functions um, between those two packages. Um, so for accessing data within both uh, kinds of objects, so from here I'll refer to them as core set, um, that refers to both a pharmaco set or a radio set. Um, we have a number of uh, accessor methods available for uh, the different types of data that I discussed in the class diagram. Um, so firstly, we have metadata. Um, and within these objects, there are two common metadata slots that are useful um, directly in analysis. Um, the first of those is the cell slot. Um, so this slot uh, stores cell line annotations. Um, for either a radio set or a pharmaco set. Um, and this can be accessed using the cell info method um, past a core set object. Um, and what it will return is a data frame of uh, cell, uh, cell line annotations uh, with two standardized columns. The first being cell ID, uh, which is a unique and curated identifier of the cell line and tissue ID, which is a unique and curated uh, identifier of the tissue. Uh, in addition to this, uh, a number, uh, a variable number of additional columns will be returned, um, which correspond to cell line annotations um, from the publication um, that the, the data set was constructed from. Uh, so they may contain a lot more information. In some cases, there's only a few columns. It, it varies. Um, the next major metadata slot um, is a spot containing the treatment response data for the experiment. Um, and uh, those differ currently between the two packages. Um, and for accessing the pharmaco, uh, the treatment response in a pharmaco set object, um, you access the drug slot. So um, analogous to the cell info, you would instead call a drug info on a P set um, and get a data frame uh, with the annotations associated with the different drugs used in the pharmaco set. Um, for a radio set, um, you're accessing the radiation slot and correspondingly you call um, the radiation um, info uh, to get the metadata about that slot. Okay, so moving on, uh, we'll have a look at accessing molecular data within um, a pharmaco set and a radio set. Um, so within both of these objects, uh, this is stored in the molecular profile slot. Um, and in both cases, it is a list of summarized experiment objects uh, named by the type of data they contain. For example, uh, RNA, CNV, mutation, um, et cetera. Um, so one of the most important uh, accessor functions to know when we're dealing with molecular data is called mDataNames. Um, and what this function will do is it will take your core set and return um, a character vector of all available data types. Um, these can then be used um, with more specific accessor methods to get information from each uh, specific summarized experiment object uh, contained within that uh, pharmaco set or radio set. Um, so there are several common accessors that you should know about. Um, first is PhenoInfo. Um, and that'll take your object as well as um, a character uh, vector specifying the, the data type you'd like to retrieve. Um, and this will retrieve um, 
phenotypic metadata um, on the samples uh, in the given summarized experiment object. Um, taking the same arguments is the feature info function, um, and this returns a data frame containing um, feature annotations and metadata from the summarized experiment object. Um, and finally, to access the raw assay measurements, you will call the molecular profiles um, accessor method. Um, and this will return um, a feature by sample matrix um, where the values are the actual assay measurements for each molecular data type. Um, the final data type to discuss accessing um, is the treatment response data. Um, so within a pharmaco set and radio set, these are stored in um, both the sensitivity and perturbation slots. Um, in this case, because sensitivity is much more common um, and I believe is currently only slot available in radio sets, um, we're going to use these as uh, the examples, but you can take any of these methods and replace sensitivity with perturbation to associate, uh, to access data from um, the perturbation slot. Um, so to start with, um, there's the sensitivity raw function. Um, and what this function does is it returns an array um, with three dimensions. The first dimension uh, represents the cell line drug combination um, used for that treatment. The second dimension uh, represents the dose level um, given to that drug cell line combination. Um, and the third dimension um, in the first index stores the drug concentration um, for each dose level. And in the second index stores the viability data um, for each dose level. Um, in addition to the raw sensitivity data, um, we provide the sensitivity profiles method, um, which is um, there to return a set of pre-computed um, sensitivity measures. Um, so for example, in a pharmaco set, um, we have pre-computed things like IC50, AAC, um, and some other standard um, sensitivity measurements uh, for you so you don't have to run the functions, which can sometimes be computationally intensive. Um, finally, to access metadata about um, the sensitivity experiments, um, you call the sensitivity info function on either a PSET or an RSET, um, and this will return uh, a data frame uh, with uh, metadata associated with that experiment. Okay, so next we're going to talk about subsetting um, a pharmacoset object. And um, these are equivalent uh, for an R set, except um, in all places where we specify drug, you switch to radiation. Um, and there's two major modalities for subsetting these objects. Um, the first is using the subset to method, um, and it will take uh, as its first argument the object to subset. and um, as its uh, second named argument, uh, for example, in PharmacoGX drugs, um, there's also, I believe, an argument called cells, uh, which will allow you to select uh, cell lines. Um, so you can see here in our example, we're subsetting the GDSC data set um, to Paclitaxel, and this returns a summarized experiment um, containing only cell lines treated with that drug. Um, the second modality of subsetting in these objects uh, is the single bracket subsetting. Um, and in this case, a pharmacoset or radio set can be thought of um, as a two-dimensional object. Um, the first dimension being cell line and the second dimension being uh, the respective treatment, either drug or radiation. Um, so you can see in our example here, uh, we're subsetting GDSC for the YT cell line treated with Paclitaxel. Um, and it returns the associated subset summarized experiment. Um, there are some exercises that we've provided here to work through. Um, we recommend that you try these out um, as they are fun and a learning experience. Okay, moving on to the Ziva package. Um, this package does not depend on Core GX um, yet. We'll see uh, what happens in the future. Um, and as a result, the accessor methods are quite different. Um, so some of the key accessor methods for this, um, to get metadata about your uh, different PDX models available within that object, um, you call the model info function on the associated Ziva set. Um, and this will return uh, a data frame um, with the model ID as well as a number of uh, annotation columns associated with those, such as uh, the patient that they came from, what the tissue type is, um, the drug treatment, if any. 
Um, the next important accessor method is uh, get experiment. Um, and this will return um, the actual treatment response data uh, for a given model ID. Um, so you can see here, we're calling um, get experiment on the BRCA data set uh, for the model ID of, uh, I won't read it. Um, and what we return from that is a data frame um, with the model ID, um, the drug name, uh, as well as uh, the associated uh, treatment response data. Um, a final important accessor to method here um, is for accessing batches. As we mentioned above, a batch uh, corresponds to a set of samples from a single patient uh, with a single treatment, and it has both a control arm um, and a treatment arm for whichever drug uh, or drug combination was administered. Um, so this method actually um, functions in two ways. First, if you call just batch info on a Ziva set, it will return a character vector of available batches. Um, if you know which batch you want to access, um, you can get additional data by passing in the batch argument, um, specifying the name of the batch you want, uh, and that will give you um, back uh, a list uh, containing the, the name of the batch as well as the name of both the control and the treatment branches of that batch, um, which you can then use for uh, uh, finding the different models associated with that. Okay, um, Arvind, is there anything we should address right now in the questions? Are, I think we are good for now. We have some questions, but we can discuss at the end. Okay, then I'm going to switch gears a bit. Uh, so we talked a lot about the technical sort of, how do you download data? How do you access it uh, to extract it out of our objects? Uh, but now I want to talk about some of the functions that these packages provide to visualize the data in these objects uh, and also to start to model this sensitivity data and uh, try to derive some summaries, some single, basically take a curve and derive a single number uh, that you can then use to categorize cell lines, for example, as sensitive or insensitive to a treatment. Uh, so starting with PharmacoGX with drug treatments, um, and plotting the data. So we have implemented a function, we call it drug dose response curve, trying to be descriptive of what it shows. And what it does is it takes cells, so cell line names and a drug name. Here I'm plotting lapatinib on these three cell lines. And uh, what I'm going to do, so first of all, uh, these drug names, uh, if you want to be sure uh, exactly which name of to use for the drug uh, depending on the data set. Uh, if you call the drug names or look at the drug info slot, uh, it'll show you what the standardized identifiers are in the data set um, under drug ID. And then calling drug dose response curve, I can pass in the name of a cell line here. It's SKML2 and lapatinib looking at the response. Uh, and I can pass in one or more pharmacosets uh, to create a plot, which is just dose on the log scale versus viability. Uh, and it'll plot both of these uh, together um, and also show you the overlapping concentration range. And we have a few examples in this um, vignette. Uh, I believe, I apologize, one of the legend labels isn't uh, plotting just because we subsetted the data and we lost one of the columns for the area above the curve um, for the GDSC data set. But when you have the full data set, uh, it should plot the, both the labels. And as you can see, it, this lets you look at the actual raw uh, screening data uh, and detect things like when two data sets disagree here, one of them shows no response to lapatinib while the other one shows uh, increasing response with increasing dose. Uh, this same function could be used to plot your own data. Um, here I just create some very artificial data and pass it in to drug dose response curve uh, get, using the concentrations and viabilities parameter. And this takes a list, um, mainly because again, you can plot multiple curves and it plots it for you. Um, 
So that's how you visualize this dose response data. And then one thing that we might want to do is, so sometimes these curves are quite um, clean. This one is a fairly good curve. These ones have some um, noise in them, but a lot of the time you want to fit a theoretical model to this and then try to derive parameters such as the IC50 or what's the estimated concentration that's required to reach a 50% viability. And so for this, I'm going to zoom in just a tiny bit. Um, in PharmacoGX, we implemented a function to fit a hill curve model to this data. Uh, the hill curve model basically is a log logistic model. So it's a logistic model uh, when your concentration is on the log scale. Uh, it takes this form and then it has three parameters. One of them is the E infinity, uh, or we call E infinity. It's the maximal inhibition predicted with an infinite concentration of the drug. Uh, there's the EC50, which is the concentration at which you see the inflection point of your logit. And there's a hill slope parameter which controls the slope of this curve and also can be interpreted as looking at whether the binding of the drug to its uh, target is cooperative or, uh, I guess, whether uh, inhibitive and in whether one bound drug can inhibit further binding to other targets. And so a hill curve usually looks something like this. Uh, and here the EC50 is the inflection point while the IC50 would be uh, where it crosses in our nomenclature, the 50%. Um, we implement a function called log logistic regression. Again, given values, it'll, you pass them in and it gives you back these three parameters. And the, but for basically simplifying our user's analysis for every data set, we also uh, pre-compute these parameters and store them in the sensitivity profile slot. Uh, and then we want to summarize these curves often for our analysis into a single number. And we implement several ways of doing that. Uh, one of them is the area above the curve, which as you'll see uh, throughout the vignette is our preferred method. But again, as I was discussing, there's the IC50, which is the crossing point of this 50%. The inflection point could be an interesting parameter for you. Or the Emax, which is the maximal observed inhibition at your highest concentration tested. And for these, uh, we also provide functions such as compute AUC or compute IC50 uh, for you to be able to easily uh, compute these values. I'm going to move on to Radio GX. So it's a very similar idea. Uh, you also have dose versus response, but actually the model that you uh, fit to this data is different and that's why it exists in its own package. Uh, the standard model used to model radiation response is actually linear quadratic model, uh, which is an exponential uh, with a linear quadratic equation. Um, I apologize, this should be a plus there. Uh, the way you interpret the two parameters, it has an alpha and a beta parameter. Uh, the beta parameter is a measure of how sensitive uh, whatever you we're profiling was to double hits of radiation. So two events of ionizing radiation causing damage to uh, the DNA and uh, double-stranded break. And the alpha parameter is sensitivity to a single damage event. Um, so yes, in the vignette, we go through extracting the raw sensitivity data from a, a R set and then using that data using our linear quadratic model function uh, to fit these two parameters. And it also gives you back an R squared measure of goodness of fit. Um, similar to pharmacogenomics, you might want to summarize this into a single number. Uh, and two summary measures that are often, or we found often used in the literature are the survival fraction at a dose of two gray, um, which is basically, if we go to uh, sorry, I'm scrolling the wrong way. At a dose of two gray, it's what fraction of cells survived, or the D10, which is a sometimes extrapolated measure, but at a dose of 10 gray, what is the predicted 
uh, sorry, what is the dose that is predicted to leave only 10% of the cells surviving? So it's the, you find the 10% mark and it's the dose that intersects that. And as you can see, we also implement a curve to plot this data. We just call it dose response curve uh, and given values, it'll plot the data and if you use plot type both, it'll actually plot the fitted model as well as the points. And in the legend, you get all the information about uh, your curve fit. So I'm gonna move on to Ziva. Um, Arvind, if you want to yep. take over. Yeah. So uh, we have functions to visualize the data in Ziva, which provides you facility to look at the individual PDX model. So this, the first function is plot PDX. So here uh, in this function, you provide the object name, uh, your Jiva set name and the patient ID for which patient you want to see the model and the name of the drug that you want to see. And it will plot the treatment curve uh, or, or the response of this uh, particular drug on the PDX curve here, where you see the volume uh, across the Y axis and the time across the X axis. Uh, but if you want to also see the control uh, PDX along with this, then you will also specify the name of the control. Uh, so here the control is called untreated. So if you write control name equal to untreated, it will plot also the control. So here the red plot, the red line represents the control PDX and the blue line represents the treatment PDX group. Uh, specifically in this particular data set, we have only one mouse or one PDX in the control arm and only one PDX in the treatment arm. So that's why you are seeing only one uh, line for treatment and control. Uh, but if you have multiple models, uh, you can see individual PDX model also, uh, which is shown here. So this is this particular model object contains replicates basically. So here, each dotted line represents one individual PDX and the solid lines represent the average over all these uh, PDX models. Okay, so uh, Peter, can you go up? And yeah, so, so this is, oh, sorry. Yeah, uh, you can also visualize this data in terms of normalized volume. That is, uh, we, we subtract the initial and divide it by initial volume of this just by mentioning volume dot normal equal to true. If you uh, specify this uh, option, then the plots will be normalized in considering the initial volume is zero. And in this case, if you see that PDX curve is going down or the volume is less than zero, it means you're seeing a response or you're seeing a shrinking in the volume. So we provide different kind of, we, uh, this plot PDX function provide a lot of options to visualize the PDX data uh, down. So in terms of quantifying the response as Peter discussed earlier in cell lines, we have AUC or ACC and IC50 and all these matrices. Uh, we have several matrices for the PDX drug response quantification also. And many of these matrices are already pre-computed with the object as well as we have functions to compute these matrices so you can compute it uh, yourself or for your data. So the function to compute the response is called simply response where you specify the object name and the model ID for which model you want to compute the response and what matrix you want to compute. So there is a, a list of uh, matrices that you can compute. So here we choose something called mRegist, which is a modified criteria of the regist criteria that is used in the clinic. So this gives you different kind of information about this mRegist, including the change in volume, average response, so forth, and the mRegist value here shown in, as a PR. So basically it gives you very detailed information about this mRegist computation. Uh, similarly, you can compute AUC and uh, all angle between treatment control and so forth. Now, uh, if you have a lot of PDXs or you are doing large scale experiments or you're using large scale data, then you can visualize this data by simply using the plot and register function. So first you extract 
all the response or MHS response, uh, Peter, a little up. Yeah, uh, using the summarize response function. So the summarize response function provides you response from different PDX models and groups them by patient or by and by drug. So you get basically a matrix of your full total of, of all the experiments or across all the PDX models, and then plot and register function can plot this uh, matrix. And you specify here uh, what is the name of the control, and it will put it in the first row. So what you see in this uh, heat map is the response is in terms of M resist as we discussed earlier, which is divided into four categories. Uh, CR is for complete response, PR is partial response, stable disease, progressive disease. So basically blue means you are getting a response, red means you are not getting a response. Each column here represents PDXs from one particular patient. And the drugs that have been tested on those PDXs are shown as a row name. And the first row represents the untreated or the control, uh, basically. So this kind of visualization helps you to, or gives you an overview of the, all the experiments uh, that you are doing if you're running a large scale PDX based clinical trial. So for example, this particular patient in the middle, you see there, there are a lot of blue uh, boxes you see. So this particular patient's PDXs are responding to different drugs. While for some other patients like uh, almost at the end, uh, you will see that most of them are red or yellow, which represents that these patients PDXs are not responding to any of these drugs. Peter? Yeah. Um, just to check for questions while I scroll. Uh, Chris, was there anything? Um, no, there's a question about generalizing our packages to uh, non non cancer um, uses, but I think that's for the end probably. Okay. We, we are running close to the end. So I'm going to say only a few quick words on the summary functions. Basically, these functions are implemented when you have replicated molecular or sensitivity screening. Uh, they're just a convenience function to uh, build a matrix such as one Per cell line, you have one column. Per drug, you have one row. And um, they do all the averaging, or you can choose various ways to average measurements. And then uh, they also fill in any missing values in these tables. Uh, so we have an example here of how to look at, across all the cell lines in our provided data sets, response to different drugs. Uh, but what I want to get to, is this section on uh, drug sensitivity signatures and uh, also leading into biomarker discovery. Um, so in our packages uh, in PharmacoGX, we implement a function called drug sensitivity sig, uh, which what it does is it implements a very uh, sort of first pass analysis of the data. And it looks at linear associations between each molecular feature that you provide to the function in our examples, we use RNA, but it also use, can be used on binarized mutation data or on uh, copy number variation, which uh, in that case, we look at log R ratios. Um, and here we show an example for the GDSE data set and using the area above the curve measure. So this is the area above this drug dose response curve for each experiment, looking at a few drugs and a small subset of the genes. It'll estimate, it'll give you back a standardized estimate of how strongly these two correlate. Uh, and also some statistics and a p-value and an FDR measure um, on how significant this association is given the data that uh, was profiled in the data set. Uh, this is done similarly in the uh, Radio GX for RAD sensitivity SIG uh, follows a very similar pattern. And then we also um, have an example here for the using this, um, doing this possibly manually using Ziva. But again, Ziva also provides a similar uh, drug sensitivity SIG function. 
So what I want to move on to is our last section, which was uh, showing an example of how you can use these packages together. Uh, and in our vignette, we have two examples. This is where we uh, encourage you either to follow along in the RStudio server that's provided uh, right now or later. Um, and here first, I'll let uh, Chris go over the section, but we look at comparing uh, sensitivity signature between radiation and drug response uh, using the functions integrated in this or developed in our package. Okay, so as Peter discussed above, um, we have functions for computing gene sensitivity signatures in both RadioGX and PharmacoGX. Um, so uh, as a result of this, a natural question is to ask um, how a signature for response to gamma radiation um, will compare to signatures of response in drugs. Um, using this information, hopefully we can generate a hypothesis um, for a combined uh, therapy or to gain insight into a mechanism of action. Um, so in our examples here, um, we just wanted uh, to have a note that due to the file size limits of, of this, um, we pre-computed a bunch of these. Um, Anyways, to move on, um, you can see here that we start off by loading um, the two packages and downloading the appropriate um, uh, R set and P set objects. Um, in reality, for this, you can just load them using the data function. Um, so the first thing we wanna do um, is actually compute our signatures. Um, so you can see here for the first one, we're looking um, using the feature info method on the Cleveland R set um, for RNA, and we're extracting um, genes, uh, only protein coding genes. Um, so we do something similar um, for the GDSC data set, um, and we select a number of uh, drugs, um, lapatinib and paclitaxel, uh, as well as cisplatin and dafurabinib. Um, and these were selected um, because they represent both traditional chemotherapies as well as more targeted um, therapies. So here we apply the radiation sig function. Um, this function is quite slow. You can see here we're using 16 threads for our computation um, and we pass in the uh, necessary information, um, specifically the features um, that we want to do the computation for. Um, and we do a similar thing uh, using the drugs selected in PharmacoGX, um, as well as the features selected. Um, in this case, we're using AAC uh, recomputed, which is our preferred uh, measure of drug sensitivity in uh, in vitro pharmacogenomic models. Um, so you can see here, we've actually pre-computed these signatures for you, um, and they can be loaded using data GDSC SIGs and data RAD SIGs. Um, so the first thing we want to do um, is intersect uh, the gene names of these two signature objects um, to get the common genes. We then subset them uh, down uh, to only uh, shared genes. Um, so now we go directly into comparing the signatures. So I guess this is the uh, interesting part. What we're going to call the connectivity score function, uh, which wraps around two methods. Um, there's an interface to gene set expression analysis. Uh, if you want to connect your sensitivity signature to a disease or pathway gene set, um, it also implements uh, genome-wide weighted correlation, which is what we're going to be looking at uh, in this case. Um, so if you look below here, um, we are applying the connectivity score function um, using both our uh, radiation signature uh, and our uh, gene signatures from PharmacoGX. Um, you can see the method we, we've selected is DWC representing um, genome-wide weighted correlation. Um, and we choose a number of permutations uh, that we want to do this over. So uh, now when we get to the interesting part, you can see the results here. Um, what, what you have is your connectivity score. Um, so this is a, a measure of um, the correlation between response um, and the selected features that we subset on. Um, so you can see you get a p-value associated with each one, um, and this play, in this case, um, the interesting result is cisplatin. Um, so you can see here the score is negative 0.51, um, and this can be interpreted as showing um, that these two um, correlations with response um, are actually targeting different genes. Um, 
within uh, the biological systems. Yes, so in general, negative signatures of correlation will be more interesting. Cisplatin is particularly interesting in this case because it's a commonly used uh, radio sensitizing agent, um, which has been shown um, in other studies, increased efficacy of radiation treatment um, in combined therapy. Uh, so the negative correlations can be naively interpreted to predict um, that the radiation and cisplatin target uh, different subpopulations uh, of cells within a tumor. Um, but the picture is probably not this simple, uh, given the radio sensitizing properties um, known in cisplatin, specifically by its ability to impair non-homologous end joining in DNA repair, um, and that uh, in cells that lack the NEHJ pathway um, already tend to be hypersensitive to radiation. Um, so therefore, you know, this is likely a synergistic mechanism and not just a result of intratumor heterogeneity. Um, so this uh, shows how you might identify uh, potential uh, synergistic therapies. Okay, given, I think we have two minutes left. We're actually over time, strictly speaking, but I wanted to ask if there was a commonly upvoted question. Okay. There was a question about uh, why PharmacoGX needs to be cancer specific. Uh, so yes, it, there definitely isn't necessarily anything in our package that has to be cancer specific. Uh, we work for a cancer center, so that was what motivated us to build the package. And we just find that um, in terms of the diversity of models available, especially with different genetic backgrounds, uh, cancer cell lines are one of the most diverse options for that uh, to do this sort of research. Uh, but yeah, definitely um, it is possible to generalize this to other disease types uh, that may have similar experimental design. Okay, and I do want to point out there's a second case study in the vignette that unfortunately we don't have time to get to. Is it easy to create your own Ziva object? Arvind, I think you can comment on that. Uh, but the answer is yes, the short answer. <laughs> uh, yeah, we provide a function to create Jiva set as well as there is a vignette in the package which lets you know how to create it. It's very uh, easy to do. You just have to uh, create a data frame which provides the uh, PDX volume and time uh, column and it creates the Jiva set. So it's possible and it's quite easy. To, and you can always contact us if you face any problem in these methods. Uh, so yeah, if there's any other questions, we will be on the Slack and able to answer them. Thank you everyone for joining.